Hear the word of the Lord this morning. First John chapter four, I'm going to start in verse seven. And if this is long, and it's long, it's a long time to stand up. They stood while they read the book of Deuteronomy. So, you know, email somebody. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God love, loves us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the father has sent his son as the savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the son of God and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. Those who do not love a brother, those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. So there's this age-old question we've all wondered about. Most of us have asked someone for a definition or an explanation at least one time in our lives. And we want to get a handle on it because we're afraid of getting it wrong. And we don't, we don't want to miss it. We're afraid that if we miss it, it might not come around again. So there have been countless songs, poems, and wise sayings about it. But it's one of those questions that has an answer that we can't quantify or precisely put into words. And there are so many different answers about it that are, they're different, but they're, they're the same. And so they're all good, but they're different, but they're... So what do we do with that? And the question, what is love? What is love? And the usual somewhat elementary answer we get about it at first is love is a feeling. It's that butterflies in the stomach. I can't stop thinking about this person. They're perfect in every way. It's that kind of love. Well, we all know that doesn't last. Um, okay. And then we get taught that love is more than a feeling. Love is more than a feeling. And that always reminds me of this picture. Do we have the picture? I'm always wondering where it's going to be. It's behind me today. Okay, so if you can't see it, if you're on radio with us, right, if you're driving. So it's uh, an elderly couple sitting at either side of a park bench, right? And the old man, he has kind of a scowl still on his face, uh, but it's begun to rain. And so he's holding out the umbrella uh, for his wife and she kind of still upset. They've obviously had an argument, but she's kind of got a smile on her face. And the caption says, love is caring for each other even when you're angry. It leads us to this next idea of love that we're taught, right? It's more than a feeling. Love is an action. Love is doing things for the people I care about, even when I don't feel like it, even when I don't want to. But love is a feeling. Love is an action. It still doesn't quite get at the heart of the matter. 
And so as I was trying to get ready for this sermon, what takes us deeper than feeling? What takes us deeper than action? I remembered uh, this book we have in the office. It's part of the Seedbed Seedlings. Now, if you're unfamiliar uh, familiar about Seedbed, Seedbed is a publishing company that started out of Asbury Seminary, uh, and now they've grown past that. But there's a series of small books that they have called Seedlings. It's, it's literally about this big, uh, and they're meant to be introductions to the faith, introdu introductions to the Methodist tradition. And one of the Seedlings in that series was written by Joseph Dongle, uh, and it's called Sola Sancta Caritas. Sola Sancta Caritas, one holy love. And you're going, okay, it's not a very good introduction if I can't read the title. But you, you've, heard of, you've heard of this stuff. You can read it, right? Sola Scriptura. Has anybody ever heard Sola Scriptura? By scripture alone. Sola Fide. By faith alone, you've heard of the five solas. He came up with the six. He didn't come up with it. He said there's a sixth one. Sola sancta caritas. By one holy love alone. And in this booklet about holy love, Joseph Angle lays out, he says that love is something prior to and beneath the action it sponsors. Love is a matter of the heart. A disposition that is deeper and longer lasting than the specific actions we undertake. And he takes us to Romans 5.8 where it says that God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And explains that love was something already residing in God. Something already a part of God's character long before he proved or demonstrated this love in the act of giving his son. Love precedes action. And so if love is not simply a feeling, if it's not merely an action, our first love lesson this morning is a simple one. God is love. God is love. And as we talk about who God is and what God has done for us and what drives God to save us, even while we are yet sinners, we come to understand the chief attribute of God is his love. It's not his supremacy, his sovereignty, or his authority. Now, God has all things. Those things will not be undone by anyone. They are the highest in God. They are all true. God is sovereign. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and almighty. But everything that God does is rooted in who God is, and who God is is love. It is the very core defining nature of his character. I mean, John says it here in verse 9. God's love was revealed among us in this way. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. So the fact is that God's love is not only foundational to all the other lessons about love, it is the very foundation of life itself. We must realize that this love was at the core of God's heart before the foundation of the world and before the formation of you and I. That God sent his son to prove his love, to demonstrate his love, to reveal his love among us so that we would know the core of his being, the chief characteristic of our creator. That through Christ, God revealed once and for all that his most important, most pervasive, most palatable characteristic is his love. God's love wasn't for us, wasn't something that developed over time. It was there before time began. It was the love of God that drove him to create us in his image and breathe the spirit of life into our souls in Genesis 2. And it's the very same love of God that brings us newness of life in Jesus Christ through the spirit and truth of his word. 
We know that before Christ, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and that in Christ, we are born again in newness of life, set free from the bondage of sin and death, and able to live as children in the kingdom of God. And what that teaches us, what we already know is that salvation is the process. Are you aware that salvation is a process of unveil, uh, revealing, unveiling God's love? Yes? No? Do you want to know what the process is? Yes. Do you? I'm going to talk to these people over here. The rest of you want to know? Okay, first, because of original sin, the fall in Genesis 3, I am completely unaware of God and his great love for me. But even at that point, while I am dead as yet sinner, right, even at that point, God is moving and he's working in my life to try to draw me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And then something is going to happen in my life. I'm going to hear a sermon. I'm going to read a book. My friend, my coworker is going to preach the gospel to me. I don't know. Maybe God even is going to appear to me in a dream. He still does that, by the way. And I, that after that happens, I begin to become aware that I am a sinner in need of salvation. And as I turn my eyes to the cross of Christ and trust in the name of Jesus, I find at the cross of Christ the overwhelming grace and mercy of God and my sins are forgiven. As deep and as dirty and as dark, as wretched as they may have once been, at the cross of Christ, I find that the blood of the Lamb has washed me clean and I stand as white as snow. This is all unveiling and revealing God's great love for us. And now I find myself wrapped in God's grace, entering, emerging, a newness of life. I have eyes to see and ears to hear the wonders of his love. I see it in all of his creation. The grass is greener. The sun is brighter. The air more crisp. And the rain is more refreshing. And the people, once I get these eyes and these ears, the people, saints, sinners, and everyone in between, the people of God's creation is our second lesson about God's love. Because it says here in verse 11 that since God loves us so much, we ought to love one another. For if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. We talk so much about abiding in Christ, Christ abiding in us. John says it happens first and foremost as we love one another. In the same way that God's love was made known to us by the sending of his son, the degree to which God abides within us is made known by the love we have for one another. Again, right here in verse 13, it is by this that we know we abide in him and he in us. And it's because of the spirit which he has given us. And you know, John, he is not saying, well, let's just all love one another. Let's get along. We'll be a happy, healthy church and we'll prove that God is in this place because that's not what he said. John didn't say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're all Christians now. You can't be mad at one another. You can't have cross words with one another. You can't shoot daggers at people. It's all smiles and unicorns or Jesus won't come back. That's not what it says. John didn't say that. John said, the proof isn't just in the actions. It's in the spirit by which the actions are done. And the spirit through which we judge all spirits is the Holy Spirit. And that is a spirit that God has given each and every one of us. It is not reserved for any uh, hierarchy in the church. I don't have any more of the spirit of God than you do. And if I do, then that's on you, not on me. You with me? Okay, you have the same access to the same spirit that I've got, the dug out, that anybody's got across human history, across being born again into this newness of life. That's where we get it. That's how we get it. So let me slow down. I'm, I'm, I'm losing some of you. Okay, you with me? You've all experienced this, this right? 
You just didn't know it. You just didn't describe it this way. Here it is. Now, before I say it, don't raise your hands. And if they're sitting next to you, don't turn and look at them. Ethan, I'm picking on you. He said, why did you do it? Now, how many of you, you've been interacting with someone, you know, and they're saying all the right things the right way, and they're doing all of the right things at the right time, but something is off. Something in you is telling you something is off, right? Your spidey senses are tingling, the, the trip wires are going off, the bells and the whistles, and you know that it's not right. You feel like you're being swindled a little bit. You feel like you're being sold some snake oil, maybe. Well, one of you has a spirit from God, and the other one has a spirit masquerading as the angel of light. Well, which one is that? Well, there's two tests that John gives us about discerning the spirits. First, who do they say Jesus is? Second, how do they love people? Is Jesus the only begotten Son of God and Savior of the world? How does your confession of Christ as Lord affect the way you treat people, especially your brothers and sisters in the church? There cannot, there will not be two Holy Spirits in the church. There is only one Spirit that is from God, and anything else is building us up to be something other than God's church. So we'll try it again. Is Jesus the only begotten Son? of God, Savior of the world. Yes. How does your confession of Christ as Lord affect the way you treat people in God's church? So John's point is, is if, if we can't get it right in here, then we're never going to get it right out there. To put it another way, you know, we spend so much time thinking about evangelism and missions and bringing people into the church without ever stopping to think, what exactly are we bringing them into? The Barna Group did a study years ago about the younger generation and the church. And what they found was that, you know, young people, they were going around uh, and they were looking for community and authenticity, community and authenticity, and they weren't finding it in the church hit me like a ton of bricks. Right? Like we wonder why the younger generation has walked away from the church and why the next generation has stayed away from the church altogether. And the sobering reality is, is that they came in. They gave us a try. And we didn't have an authentic community to give them. So they went looking for it somewhere else. But there is no life outside of God's church. And what gives me hope about that study is I'm watching the church self-correct. It started small in pockets and it's moving across the nation. And while we call it different things and while we have different methods to go about it, as the church steps into this more authentic movement of being a community where we band together bear with one another in our sins, and help each other live out the forgiveness of the gospel. We're all calling the end result the same thing. Do you know what it's called when the church starts to act this way, where they start to, to build authentic community, where we confess sins, where we hold each other accountable to live as children of God, and where we express God's love? And you know what they're calling the end result of that? Revival. Revival. These are the seedlings of revival. John Wesley called it bands. You, you might, again, we call it different things. The confession of sins, and more importantly, not just sins, right? We don't beat you over the head with the condemnation. We've got the resurrected Christ. We want to shower you with the love and the grace of God, and we want to, what, build each other up with our speeches, right? Because John reminds us that no one has ever seen God. And so what that means is that all you and I have is each other. That God manifests his love for us through Jesus Christ so that you and I 
could manifest God's love to each other here and now, that we would be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. And that's the next step in the process of salvation. It's God's love being perfected in us and through us. So again, first, I'm totally unaware of God or his love. Then I come to see that I'm a sinner in need of salvation. I'm met with God's grace and mercy through Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection from the grave. I'm born again into a newness of life that abides in God's love. God's love abides in me, and it's being perfected in me. And don't shy away from that phrase. Don't ignore that. Don't write that off. Do you think John... Is just talking, is he just a good preacher, being eloquent, being bombastic, or is John giving us the truth of God's word? Come on, church. Is John just making stuff up to make you feel better, or is he giving you the truth of God's word? Good. So do you want the truth? Good. And the Greek word here for perfection doesn't mean no mistakes. So stop talking about it like that. I can't be perfect. Well, read your Bible, right? Biblical perfection was never about not making mistakes. It's not what the Greek word means. It's not how the Bible was written. Biblical perfection was about abiding in God's love more and more until we are completely consumed with the love of God. And this is how Jesus can stand on the mountain in Matthew 5 and say to us with all sincerity and intentionality and purpose, be perfect, for your heavenly Father is perfect. And this is where John goes for our third lesson about God's love. That love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. And there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And so often we talk about love casting out fear, we go straight to this idea that Christians, well, you're supposed to not be scared of anything because you're so perfect and strong. No, 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 they didn't say that anywhere. It's terrifying out there. There's no fear on the day of judgment. There's no fear because our salvation that is founded on Jesus Christ has it founded in a person whose being was rooted in God's great love for us. Perfect fear or perfect love, either one, perfect love cast out the fear of condemnation, of retribution, of hellfire, because God's wrath has been satisfied. And God's love is being perfected in us so that as we abide in Christ, it casts out the fear that we are not enough, that we might not somehow be acceptable to God or presented as right and pleasing to God when we meet him on that final day. Because it's exactly when we start to feel that way that God screams down from the heavens that this is exactly what my love covers. I saw you in your sin and your shame, and I sent my son to redeem you. I covered you with my grace and my mercy, and there is nothing that can separate you from my love. For there is nothing more powerful than a father's love for his children and because I am the ultimate father, you are the ultimate child. You who confess Jesus as my son and your savior, you will be victorious in all things and through all things because my son is the author and the perfecter of the faith. And you are loved not because of anything you have done, but because of who I have created you to be. And in me, there is no fear, for you are perfectly and wholly and wonderfully loved. Now get up and fight. There's plenty of these things in this world that will cause us to be afraid. Being scared of the evils of this world do not make you a bad Christian. They don't make you an unauthentic one. Being honest about our fears is what helps us realize where our strength comes from. It's what helps us realize exactly where we're placing our ultimate aim and desire. 
what our disposition is. Love is not a feeling or an action. Love springs from the heart that drives the action. And if we have nothing to fear on that final day, then we have nothing to fear on this earth because we know how the story ends. Victory over sin and death has already been won. What can man do to me now? Now, I don't want to suffer in this world, and I don't want to do anything that puts my family in harm's way. At the same time, I don't care. I will take all the necessary precautions to keep my loved ones safe. I'm even going to be slightly paranoid about it, okay? But fear will not stop us from being the hands and the feet that shines God's love into a broken and dark world. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Last week, Doug talked about loving each other by getting to, one, getting to know one another and all the fear that comes along with that. And I want you to know that, you know, that's not just a syndrome of large churches. I pastored a, a small church in Missouri. They told me the exact same story. All right, there was a lady, uh, she'd been attending there several years. She was sitting on one side of the sanctuary and, you know, horridness of all horridness, somebody sat in her spot one Sunday. Can you believe the audacity of some people to come into a Methodist church and sit in somebody's pew? I mean, really? And so she found herself sitting on the other side of the sanctuary that particular Sunday. And while the greeting she received was warm and inviting and loving, she was also greeted like it was her very first time. Oops. Now, they've ended up having a good laugh about it later. But here were two people sitting in the same service for years. They didn't even recognize one another. Forget about, I don't know your name. Like, I don't know if I've ever seen you here before. I've been coming here 15 years, right? Okay, so we'll get over that, right? We have to. Let me tell you why. We know that everyone wants to be loved, and we've all been in situations that has made us feel unloved, unvalued. Yet it's so easy to overlook the fact that the deepest longings we have about being loved comes by way of being seen and being known. Okay? So why don't we try that, right? You know, you see somebody like, hey, see you, brother. Great to have you. That's all it takes. Hey, see you. Richard, I see you up there. Love you. He goes, okay, don't see me so much. Don't call me out in the middle of the sermon. Right? Richard and Ethan aren't coming back. That's all right. You know, maybe it's no accident that John bookends the sermon, uh, the, the section on God's love this way, right? He opens by saying, whoever does, not, whoever does not love does not know God. That's how he opens it. Whoever does not Love does not know God. And then he concludes by saying, those who say I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And really today, one of the, the biggest phrases that's going around to let people know that they are loved and are valued is, I see you. I see you. Hey, brother, I see you. Welcome to church. Glad to see you. That's it. You don't have to talk about all this other stuff. Just see you. Glad to see you. We cannot love God if we don't know God. And if God's love abide in, abides in us and it's being perfected within us, then by definition, it compels us to express that love by truly getting to know one another and being known by one another. Like, think about it this way with me, right? If I say I love my wife... But then I can't tell you even the most basic details about her, what her hair color is, where she's from, what's her favorite food, what she likes to do. You wouldn't just question my love for her. You'd wonder if we'd ever really ever met, right? And so part of going through the immigration process, become a citizen, is uh, proof of the relationship. We want proof that this is a legitimate relationship. And a few years ago, I was talking to somebody else who had gone through this process. They said they were asked what kind of toothbrush their spouse uses. Now, this is spouses already, right? What kind of toothbrush do they use? It's like, 
brother, I don't know that. Like, I'm pensions and that kind of details. And so there's a margin of error in those types of questions. But they were also asked stuff like, well, what side of the bed does your spouse sleep on? Where do they park the car in the garage? Is there even a garage at the house? So perfectly harmless questions. But, you know, also stuff you don't have to really think too hard about for someone you're claiming to have a relationship with, right? Where do you park the car? And to become a citizen, you not only have to learn a bunch of stuff about how the government works, and I have the best joke for that. You know, my wife, she studied, you know, this is the Houses of Parliament, and this is the, and the, 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 and I said, good, you passed your test. Now forget about it, because you're an American, baby, and we don't know how the government works. <laughs> they make you learn that, but then they also, they, they, they make you take a test that you can read and write at a basic level because they want you to be able to communicate with the other citizens. Church, it says in Ephesians 2.19 that we are citizens of God's kingdom and members of his household. And so it's hard to be a church who knows God and loves God the Father while at the same time being afraid to get, getting to know their brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no fear in God's love. So we're gonna start small, right? Who's the person sitting next to you? You're probably sitting next to a family member, good for you. But who's the person sitting next to you? Maybe you don't know them, or a row or two back. But more importantly, what's their favorite color? I've known Mark Burns for years. I don't know what his favorite color is. Just getting to know people, harmless questions. And so next week when you see them, hey brother, Good to see you. Green, right? Blue, right? Mine's blue. Yeah? All right. Let's pray. Well, God, we thank you for your gracious, your wonderful, your majestic love that you have, that you would send your son to be everything we are not, to, to renew us, to give us a newness of life, and to, to bring us into your household, into your family, co-heirs, to the kingdom. May fear no longer drive who we are. May it be your holy love perfected within us, getting to know our brothers and sisters who are also made in the image of Christ. Amen.